Every day brings new details of new horrors from Manipur. How do we even begin talking about peace when people are yet to heal, when people are so bitterly divided, and when new videos documenting new acts of sexual violence, of killings, of beheadings, of rape surface literally? literally by the hour. I'm Barkhadat Yo with the Mojo story. In fact, even as we speak, we have reported today on another rape and murder that took place on exactly the same day as the sexual assault of the Manipur viral video that has so jolted all of India. In this case too, the FIR was filed on the 16th of May. The incident took place uncannily on exactly the same day as the incident of the women being paraded naked in the viral video that we have all seen. In this case too, the two young women were from the Kuki community. They used to work part-time in a car wash in Imphal East. For obvious reasons, we are not disclosing their identity. In this case too, there is a video that captures at least part of the horror. There are also other horrors. There is the story, the tragedy of an 80-year-old woman from the Maiti community whose grandson says she was burnt alive in a home that was torched, a home that had the honours that President Kalam had bestowed on her husband. As I said, every hour brings a new horror. And if you think if you think that being from one or the other community or even being partly from both exempts you, we also reported on the story of a seven-year-old boy, half kooky, half methi, burnt alive in an ambulance. Many of these incidents have happened earlier, but the details are only just emerging because Manipur finally, belatedly, has India's attention. But even now, the politics, the politics threaten to drown out any sane, honest, open conversation. The opposition is demanding that the prime minister must speak in parliament. The home minister is saying, I'm ready, start with me. But the logjam in parliament continues. Here in this, on this program, for the last two months, we have continued relentless reportage from and on Manipur. And I want to introduce two of the country's foremost experts on the Northeast as we try and ask this difficult question. How do we even begin talking about peace when we're still dealing with new horrors of violence, rape, beheadings every day? Let me introduce first to the program, Professor Bimol Okoyajam, one of India's most respected authors and experts at JNU, uh, but really has been writing very incisive uh, columns uh, on Manipur. And thank you, sir, for being with us. Also joining us is Rami Desai. She's also a very well-established expert on the Northeast and also associated with the India Foundation. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for joining us. Uh, as I said, just as we started this program, we had just documented yet another rape and murder of two young women. Um, and this rape and murder took place, according to their families, on the 4th of May. We've seen the copies of the FIR once again. Uh, an incident that takes place in May till July, we see no action. There seems to be a complete breakdown of law and order, but Beren Singh, the chief minister, is showing no signs of either resigning or being removed. Uh, is that, Professor Bimol, where we have to start talking about near-term peace? Do we need president's rule? Do we need a truth and reconciliation commission? Where do we begin this conversation about peace? Or should we not even be talking about peace right now? No, see, I have been saying from the day one, when the violence unfolded in May, uh, especially when I started speaking out in public in the second week of May, uh, I was actually shocked that the violence was allowed uh, to continue. And uh, by now, one need not repeat. It is self-evident that uh, what you expect a lawful state, how it should act and behave and control such kind of uh, violence have not happened. And I knew that, you know, as it longer it continues, then I also get to hear uh, horrible cases of uh, people being killed, eyes being gored out, head being beheaded mutilated and use the blue flame that used to, uh, you know, uh, clean the skin of uh, pigs and all of that, how it's used. 
all kinds of violence that I have heard, and I've also seen on the ground how uh, laws, people have taken uh, laws into their own hands. So I think uh, it makes sense. I've been saying this, you know, I'm now I have, I'm exhausted actually. From the day one, I have been saying that the rate of the state must work and this violence must be reined in. I've been saying this since the mid May onwards. And I have also started saying it now that the inaction of the state itself is an action that allows and aggravates the violence. I have no doubt about this now. I've also said this state government or the union government, I don't make a difference between the two because my observations over the years or historically, the power relationship between Delhi and the new uh, Imphal is uh, well known. Uh, and, and besides that, uh, these are two uh, governments of the same party. And if the union government has an upper hand, if they wanted to stop the violence, they could have stopped. This is not about BJP versus Congress or left or right. It is about human tragedy. And violence have been allowed. And I'm very sad to say this. Both the behaviors of the national media, as well as the so-called progressive elements, you have fallen into a trap of this familiar vocabulary of tribal versus non-tribal, minority, majority kind of things, without realizing the layered nature of these things. There are so much things which we can't even pronounce and say in public. The so-called experts have been commenting about minority tribal being persecuted and so on, without realizing even how the chronology has been presented in the paper, whether the ethical standards put forward by the editorial guilt of India or Press Council of India is followed or not. It's a very shameful behavior. And it is augmented by the silences of the government, including our prime minister. And, uh, you know, it's all around failure. I mean, if you point a finger to someone, uh, every institution is touched now. You have suspected the police. You have suspected the army, you have suspected the paramilitary. When the state institutions loses its legitimacy in the eyes of certain sections of the population, I'm, I'm being honest with you. Police have lost trust, both in the eyes of the Maitais and the Cookies. The Maitais have been saying that the top officials were from the Cookie tribes and they have leaked and they know all this thing pre planned, blah, 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 has been going on from the day one. Ask anybody on the ground if your journalists are going there. Similarly, cookies have been saying that the police were leading mobs to attack cookie houses. Then, you know, Assam rifles being accused of siding with the cookies and they are there right in front of them. People have been fired upon and armies have been suspected of uh, aiding the cookies and so on. These are true or not, but I'm worried that these state institutions loses its legitimacy in the eyes of the public. This yes. is a serious issue. This is a serious issue where we are almost like a Hobbesian world. And then yes. this rhetorics of communal violence and accusing each other, you are missing the point that everybody has collapsed into a Hobbesian world. And then people talk about persecution of minority, majority, a very familiar vocabulary in the rest of the country, the tribe versus non-tribe whether these vocabularies really fit into the realities on the ground, nobody bothers. But these pictures that you are showing, you will see more. And now people are going to compete on whose violence is greater, whose victimhood is greater than who else. And the dead bodies and tragedies and miseries of the people will be utilized for political gain. And that's the loss of humanity besides the very nature of the you know, a civilized state order that you expect. And people like me, though, I've been staying outside my homestead for almost four decades. It hurts. I have said this. We have spent hell sleepless nights. I'm exhausted. The hatred, the, the, the justifications of violence, nobody bothers. Everybody jumped into this madness. 
Yeah, what? I, I, you know, you've said a lot, uh, Professor. And let me let me just ask one more question before I go go to Rami. Uh, you have questioned the media narrative uh, and with anger of uh, tribal versus non-tribal. You have questioned and challenged this assumption that this has anything to do mm. with religion. You have said this is multi-layered. This is not majority minority Hindus versus Christian and so on. There are others who are arguing. Uh, for example, you you would have followed and we also reported the story of the seven-year-old boy who was burnt along with his mother uh, and, mm -hmm. as the boy was being ferried actually to hospital. And his mother was Maiti and the argument made was that, that, she, that the targeting of this boy was only because the mother was a Maiti Christian. I mean, you would have, I'm only asking you the question. I bow to your, your expertise. I am no expert on the Northeast. But when you hear questions like this, when you see stories like this, what do you say? How do you make sense of it, sir? You know, Barkha, if I remember correctly, you have some connections in your family histories with the partition of this country. Yes, sir. And I, I also have, uh, you know, the fortune or of, of having associated with almost a decade long studies on partition while I was working in CSDS under Professor Asris Nandi. And, and, you know, the moral compass collapse during partitions. The neighbors will turn on each other and and, and all sorts of violence happen, abduction of women, women's body as a site of violence, and their victimhood is being used to, to, to mobilize further violence against the other. Uh, this is this collapse of mental, uh, this one moral compass that enables this kind of violence to happen. I have seen people in cold blood just shot and kicked in and, and, and buried into the pit. And then people's bodies who's been burned with that, you know, that blue flame that you use to burn the skin of animals, the stomachs, guts have been removed. I've seen all kinds of violence. And this simply means that the moral compass in the society has collapsed. And that's why you see this kind of thing. That's what I feel. And uh, again, I'm repeating, uh, people don't bother that these things have been allowed and, and, and this is a part of a uh, largest democracy in this country. You listen to my, uh, you know, utterances on television or the media from the day one when I opened my mouth, I said why this violence was allowed, even as a reaction in Nepal, why that violence was allowed, why it was allowed to linger on has been a consistent remark from me. You, anybody yes. who hear me can check. Yes. And I think what you've said is very important that the, that the uh, authority of literally every institution, in fact, you said even the army was accused uh, of, of, of being biased and the, it led to an unprecedented uh, statement. Rami, you would have seen it from the army uh, actually saying that we are loyal to the uniform and very sharp statement. The armies had to deal with women facing off with soldiers. In one case, the army releasing uh, 12 militants to maintain the larger peace in such a situation where there is such eroded authority, certainly of, of the of the state government, certainly of the police. The army is still trying to bridge uh, some dialogue between the two communities. What should happen? Is the resignation of the chief minister uh, even relevant right now? Uh, is there an alternative to it? Is if the, if ever there was a use or a context for president's rule, this might be it. What do you think? Uh, Barka, good evening. That's a uh you know, very relevant question, you know, because things have gone so far. Uh, like uh, Professor Bernal said, from day one, anybody who was observing this, anybody who knows the state of Manipur, knew that this would take a fairly ugly turn, you know. As you may know, I've spent a considerable time, amount of time in the Northeast, and I've said this on television as well. Um, I have studied all the different states. I've lived there. I've looked at it for the past 15 years. Manipur is a complex state because it has a lot of elements that, you know, come together and there are a lot of factors that come together and cre can create and have created situations in the past that have been explosive, you know. I don't think uh, uh, history is lost on anybody uh, who's been at least a lay observer of the state. There's been the Kukinaga war, there's been the, uh, you know, maybe uh, cooking uh, baby conflict as well. And uh, even when Biren Singh took over, if you remember, there was the issue of uh, 
you know, the community not uh, uh, cremating or not uh, uh, putting the bodies to rest. There were seven or 11 bodies that, you know, uh, they were protesting with. And at that time, Berean Singh was considered a unifier of sorts. Um, and um, five years, six years down the line, this is what we've come to. You see, the fault lines have always been there. It's not as if these fault lines are new. But now with the prolonged emotional impact and, and the security situation, it has become almost, in my opinion, very difficult to bridge. It's not going to be bridged today. It's not going to be bridged tomorrow. Are we, you know, are, 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 are we saying then that uh, I know Professor Bimol has another uh, alternative model for this, which is like a separate chamber. Uh, but let me ask both of you about that before we play out some clips from the ground. Uh, are you saying that the time has come for a division of some kind, a separate council, a separate administration, Rami? Barkha, not at all. Because I think any sort of move like that is going to be you know, entirely unacceptable by one community or another, or also by the security forces as well as the central government. I think any sort of territorial change to Manipur cannot happen at this. I don't think it can ever happen. You know, this is these are legacy problems, and uh, you know, solution will have to come. But solution isn't going to come today. You know, it's going to take a lot of time, and that also, you know, uh, peace will have to come right at the beginning of this conflict. If you remember, there were all these banners uh, that were being protested with saying we want a solution first and peace later. That is not the kind of attitude that you can move forward with because, you know, you can't have any sort of bridging of gap, any sort of solution that's acceptable for both sides of the community if this kind of violence goes on. And you know what's really sad, Barkha, is that in the last uh, six years, and I've traveled in that time and I've traveled, you know, 10 years ago, you know, I've traveled every single year. You know, there was relative peace. Industry had started. Young kids were coming back from a point where I didn't, I, I could not find a decent place to eat to where I could find state-of-the-art restaurants, like the kind of restaurants you find in Delhi. What is going to happen now? So I don't think we can move forward unless complete peace comes. And over and above that, sorry. No, I was just going to say, how does that complete piece come? And can I briefly just take that to Professor Bimol? And I'll, of course, come back to you. Because Professor Bimol, there are now people, Rami says, no, first piece. Then you talk about an autonomous council, a separate administration. You have another formula. You say within the same assembly, uh, I'm paraphrasing you, so please feel free to elaborate in your own words. Within the same assembly, there can be a separate chamber, as it were. Is this the time to be discussing these formulas or do you agree with Rami that first you need somebody's authority over the state, somebody who's respected, trusted, whose authority is taken seriously? I think it is now what Rami has suggested and what uh, you have mentioned about the second chamber in the state assembly is not the question of either or. I think uh, what Rami said is absolutely right. You know, First you have to rein in this violence. It must stop. And this writ of the state must be uh, brought in you know, to, to control. That's what, what the state is all about, isn't it? You can't take uh, law into your own hands and leave your people to deal with their own uh, issues themselves, their institutions. Uh, but you know, I think uh, uh, once you do that, and since people keep on talking about uh, you know, the uh, question of redistribution of wealth and services of the state, then there is an uh, uh, you know, whether real or perceived, the fact remains that there are genuine or otherwise grievances, articulated grievances about uh, the lack of development and so on and so forth. Incidentally, I have lobbied with the uh, Ibobi government in, 19, uh, in 2012, as well as, uh, uh, you know, the CM Birin in his first innings, that something like a such a committee must be formed to investigate one, to see the uh, socio-economic and educational status of every communities in, 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 in Manipur, to see whether these allegations are right or wrong, and then you can have a comparative analysis with the neighboring states like Mizoram, Nagaland, or Assam, and so on. And two, also to see if there is any differential development in different areas or regions of the state, and what are the factors behind it, and how those things can be corrected. And these grievances can be uh, done, but unfortunately, in the political culture of the state, things have been communalized. 
is rather than looking at the objectives as kind of nobody demanded this one, including the tribals. Unfortunately, if they think that it is it is a development lacunas are there, then they should have raised this. And you know, sometimes they've been doing this as an electoral game. I remember, and I was talking to uh, Karan Thapar, and I said I wanted to give you a classic example. There was an honourable minister who raised these issues on the last day of the last session of the 11th State Assembly on 24th August, raising the issues of uh, budgetary allocations, not of that year, but to, uh, in, from 2018 uh, onwards. On the last day of the assembly, because election was already in the in, in the you know campaign mode, and this is the kind of a politics that people have been doing it uh, instead of asking for uh, a real objective analysis and yeah. how this can be corrected. So I think uh, uh, you know these issues, since the separate administration is being talked about, as I think Rami is right, any form of partition it doesn't solve. You know you you have seen in the yeah. world history. Partition of South Asia still lingers on in the form of uh, India-Pakistan relationship but, and and communal but violence. If, but and if you will we are not looking, if sorry, I'm interrupting you, but if we are not looking at a sep, you know, a territorial alteration or a demarcation or a delineation, that's the word I should actually use more carefully. Uh, at this moment, at least, and I think your idea is excellent. That first, let there be an objective assessment of uh, of of every community and how it's faring. I still want to understand. If I may say something, yes. I want to clarify something here. Yes. There's so much trust deficit in the state. Even when you form the committee, I would even suggest that bring in people from the outside, inform and respect it, economics. Uh, you know, then you will see what is the objective truth or not. If you want to even bring Native American Christian economists and development experts. I don't mind, but please do, instead of communalizing these discourses, please do an objective assessment. And I, I think I was trying to say when you just come in in between, that there is also the historicity of the place must be recognized and you know, what kind of further problem might come in, which the government of India recognizes over the years. Any attempt to uh, the, you know, change the territorial as well, even the threat to any form of territorial and geo, uh, what you said, I say, administrative and you know, uh, yes. structure of the state will be seen by certain section as a threat to the state's integrity. So instead of that, I said that uh, introduce a second chamber and then revamp the local self government, either the ADCs and the you know municipal corporations and panchayati system, so the delivery system is more accountable and more effective. These are objective rather than pointing fingers okay. to this tribe or that tribe. And that it takes care of the state's integrity's concern as well. Yes, and I'm glad you've reminded us of the geopolitics. We are talking about a, a border with Myanmar. There are all there are all kind of concerns here. But let's return for a moment to the near immediate situation. Uh, on, the, on your screen, you see images of uh, somebody who's an MLA, and he's an MLA with the ruling party. This is Wungzag in Valte, if we and and he uh, he was actually assaulted by a by a by a mob. His driver uh, was killed. Uh, his skull was smashed. He has lost the ability at the moment, at least, to walk, to eat on his own, to to form words clearly. And he's a BJP MLA. He was an advisor to the chief minister. And I called him the forgotten BJP MLA of the state. I don't know if you'll agree, but I want to play out a little clip. I was speaking to his son uh, and to his wife, and I said, "How are you managing?" They said. Uh, uh, no, can we go back to the pictures actually of Mr. Valte? And he said, uh, you know, I'm I'm struggling. He said, I'm struggling. And um and 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 no one from the state government has actually come forth to help. Listen in. We're just waiting for that clip to come up. If someone can tell me whether that clip is ready. Okay, I don't know. Uh, I think just as we're reading uh, that clip, let me actually just get responses uh, to uh, uh, to this to what happened with Vungzag and Valte. Uh, and if you have a comment, Rami, do go ahead and we'll play that clip when we're ready with it. Rami? I agree. Can you hear me, no. Parkham? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. No, I completely agree uh, with what Professor Vimal has said because you know things are very sensitive right now in the state and also. The fact that, you know, histories are different. 
um, uh, and the Maitis have their history, the Tukis have their history, the Nagas have their history. On what basis, you know, can anybody even suggest uh, any sort of territorial change? And of course, you know, we have to look at it from the lens of it having an impact on um, national security as well, because Manipur is absolutely so crucial uh, to our balance in the Northeast. So, you know, all these factors we have to take into place before we talk about things such as, you know, territorial change, especially in a state like Manipur. Um, but also having said that, we already have hill councils, Barkha. You know, it's not as if there isn't any sort of autonomy. You know, um, these hill councils also need to be able to function better because Kukis is not just one tribe. Um, there are multiple sub-tribes. Hill councils are also made out of that sort of diversity, that sort of tribal diversity. So, you know, um, there is conflict within these uh, councils as well. And I think that needs to be resolved or that needs to be somehow brought uh, up to the mark in a way that they function better than that they have been functioning. Because these councils do have a lot of powers. So apart from financial bills, healthcare, education, any sort of other decision making, um, including family laws, um, can be decided upon by these councils. So I think there is also this question of being able to think about how to make these councils function better to the best of the autonomy that is provided to them. I, I, I'm also told that we can return to those images we were showing to you of the forgotten BJP MLA and the fact that his family is struggling financially today. Just playing a small clip from that interview and I then want to talk a little bit more about that. Listen. Are you angry that there's been no offer of help from the government? Hmm. Well, what can we say? Like, if, if we don't get an offer from the government, we are just a layman person. <laughs> it seems like we are just a layman person because my father has been MLA for the third time, and he is the most senior uh, MLA among the tribal in Manipur. But still today, uh, I don't think we get enough help from the government and enough care from the government. How does that make you feel, Joseph? Uh, sometimes when I think about it, it makes me feel angry. And sometimes it made me feel like we, we don't have anyone to help us and feel like or oh, feeling like sometimes we feel like lonely. Uh, but what, what can we do? You feel lonely and alone because the chief minister yeah. called only once and there has been no financial assistance offer from the state government. Yes, yes. Do you, are you struggling for finances or are you okay right now? How are you managing? Uh, we are struggling. Mm -hmm. You're struggling but, for with, uh, with medical. But we, we got lots of help from our community and lots of help from our uh, Zomi, Kuki Zomi, right? We got lots of help from them. It's a very sad story, and I want to start with you, um, uh, Professor, if I may, uh, Professor Bimal. This is a BJP MLA. Uh, he, he's in a situation where his family is saying, Biren Singh called once, and after that, we haven't heard from anybody. We are struggling. We're managing our people. Our friends and family are helping us. He's very seriously uh, disabled now, and so therefore, they need a lot of money. And he's, you know, if you, in the whole interview, if you hear the whole interview, I asked the son, I said, what are you looking for from the state government? And he said, well, financial assistance is only one part of it. So if somebody were to just call and see how we're doing, we, no one even calls us. You know, it's like we feel alone. We're just like, I guess he calls, he says lay person. He means we're just so ordinary. We've been forgotten. Uh, your thoughts when you look at this, I mean, you know, this is a BJP MLA. No, I think it is whether he is a BJP MLA or whichever party, he's a senior politician of the state. I don't know why. I mean, I'm shocked to know that nobody call up. I mean, what kind of political culture is this? I mean, forget about one. I mean, there are 60 of them in that house. And you want the United Manipur and you can't even have that courtesy of making a call to your own fellow MLAs, who is also a senior one, 
and left alone. And this is how the community thinks gets consolidated. He has all the right to feel hurt and angry. I mean, I'm, I don't see that anger in his tone. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, if I were in his place, despite all my things, I would have been hurt, deeply hurt, and felt, you know, then, you know, this, his community is helping. I mean, this, I, I don't know, Barkawa, to say this. You see these women being paraded, raped, people being shot and burned, an old woman being burned inside the house. From that extended to this high politics, nobody call up, and Emily is lying like, what are we at the end of the day? I, even I don't want to see, I'm ashamed of. I mean. Yes, it is horrible. It is really, truly that, horrible. Uh, un, it, it is absolutely unacceptable. It is absolutely unacceptable. I mean, I, I just come to know through your program. Uh, this is the condition of a senior MLA like this. And you don't even forget your being a political class. Uh, if you you must be talking and having dinners and visiting each other as MLAs and you know, ministers and so on, when one of you lie up like that, and you know, see violence against, by the way, uh, legislatures have happened before in Manipur. In 2001, three of them or two of them were thrown into the burning uh, assemblies, people's wrath. But this is targeting a particular MLA because of this communal frenzy that has caught up in, 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 in that state. Uh, I don't know. This is the, see. This is the pain. This is the pain uh, that any anybody who looks, who has observed sin, and that is why I also get very offended and angry when people pursue over this kind of a miseries and pain and deploy these human tragedies for a political purpose. Whoever is playing it, and that is why I have huge reservation against people playing politics and violence being deployed as the means to. Have, some end. Yeah. I yes. think that is something to be called out and then stop these things, rein in this violence. I'm, I'm also much I repeat the same thing which I've said before. There must be a genuine inquiry to fix responsibility and map out the sequence of this violence. And you cannot allow things to go scot free. Yes. And you should not only think about the res, uh, retributive justice, but you also think about the restorative justice. And that is why we will talk about, you have just mentioned reconciliation, sort of a committee. Not everything may not be able to resolve at the level of the law, but the culprit must be held accountable. And also this sequence of this violence must be yeah. tracked down and mapped out how it began, who in incited. Everything should be done. Otherwise, the future of that state, even if you have whichever initiative mechanism, you will have unhealed unresolved anger and that will continue to inform an estranged relationship which can spark any moment as terrible violence in the future yes uh, rami i'm sure you have thoughts to add but let me just play out another clip this we're seeing these horrible literally orphaned abandoned senior politicians family and i think professor bibol is absolutely correct that even if he was from another party the point is he's a member of the political fraternity and to see his family struggling no one calling except for the initial one phone call uh, from uh, from the chief minister and saying we feel alone and I think Professor Bimol is absolutely correct. There was no anger in his voice. He was just helpless. I want to play out another heartbreaking account from the field of a grandson of an 80-year-old, uh, uh, you know, uh, an 80-year-old woman. And in, in a home where her husband's awards, medals, the honors from President Kalam, the whole house is torched, she is killed. This is her grandson's account. And then I'll come to you, Rami. 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. a bit. So, both are tiring all the time. ये पूरा सराउंडिंग में हो रहा था हम शेरो का सराउंडिंग में देन इसमें सब लोग शक्ति के जगह में जा रहा था देन बाद में हम बता चला था हम लोग का ग्राम मां घर का अंदर है देन इसके लिए हम वापस बसाने के लिए हम दोनों गए थे दो दोनों जाने के टाइम पे वह घर तो जला दिया था देन पूरा घर से जला कर जब हम लोग पहुंचा हुआ गिर गया था घर पे देन आफ्टर दे दे आर फायरिंग टू मच देन मैं यहां पे लगी थी तो यहां पे गोली लगी थी and एक ये पेन में भी लगा था। Then ये पे कल 
वापस हॉस्पिटल में एडमिट भी करने करने का है द गवर्नमेंट शुड गिव द प्रॉपर पनिशमेंट टू द पीपल हु डन दिस इंसिडेंट फॉर फायरिंग एंड जिंदा चला दिया था हम का ग्राउंड मार्क भी और इसका सब हिंसा भी चाहिए और वो लोग भी पनिशमेंट मिलना चाहिए Let me bring you in, Rami. Uh, we're seeing whether it's Vungzag in Valte, whether we see uh, what happens with the freedom fighter's wife. You know, grief, uh, as Professor Bimal says, should never become a competitive conversation. Unfortunately, in Manipur, that is exactly what it has become. It has become my grief is bigger than yours, my rape is worse than yours, my house being torched is worse than yours, and there is a structural collapse. where do we and there is also by the way these images that you're seeing a great debate around the role of women uh, you know there's a great debate around the role of the the mira paibis the army has at one point said that you know we need more women on the ground because w- women are obstructing security operations this is a matter also of much debate let me bring you in rami go ahead um uh, barka absolutely it's un- inconceivable that uh, you know the situation would be like this and you know it would have gone on for so long but however this is what it is and you know eventually what happens with violence especially in sensitive areas like this where there isn't you know there isn't just two communities there are other communities as well so we are looking at it from the point of kuki and maiti but there are also the nagas there are also the other communities you know where i truly as an observer my fear is of the ripple effect of it on the other communities the ripple effect of it on the bordering states you know so this has the potential of becoming bigger then it should have it already is but you know the potential is that it might become bigger if it doesn't stop at this point and um, i have always said this and i've said this from the beginning that of course you know the state you know has to be held responsible and you know like professor bimal said there has to be some amount of assessment and accountability um the communities also play a huge role apart from the defense forces we have a huge amount of forces that have been deployed on ground and you know irrespective of this person is persons that have been casted on the assam rifles the fact of the matter is almost 30 40000 people have been given shelter by them by both the uh, from both the sides and also you know 20 to 30000 people have been given safe passage way almost equal amount in you know both sides of the community so that is side i think the civil society barkha has a very big role to play because remember manipur has a huge amount of csos they have csos on each side they have you know csos for everything yet a cso has not come up from you know which represents both the communities leadership from both the communities a uh, people of influence of both the community, communities because you see states like this communities like this which have a tribal makeup the leaders the elders the influences of the communities are very important they who have is facilitating this dialogue where is this dialogue you're talking about 4000 weapons armories that have been looted 4000 weapons including high caliber weapons right rami who is going to facilitate this dialogue you now need people i'm so sorry to to say this you both are the experts but it seems to me common sensically that with the compact broken you need people to come in from the outside to facilitate this dialogue absolutely barka you do need people neutral people to come in from the outside but there is also a certain thing that i worry about which is how much do people you know the neutral people that we want to bring on ground have to have deep knowledge of the sensibilities of uh, what the communities want how they function the psychology of the communities that's what i'm saying you know as much as we've heard uh, people saying that uh you know uh, people comparing the kind of uh, pain that they've been through i am starting also barka on a positive note to hear people saying that and both the communities saying that peace must stop in my opinion if you are a uh, peace must begin if you in my opinion if you ask who could be a great uh, mediator there are other communities in the state as well you know maybe the nagas can come in you know they've had conflict which has had a prolonged impact on them they understand this they understand the sensibility not maybe naga leadership can be the neutral force between these two communities but alongside that i am saying is that the leadership of civil society you know there are some very very rational logical people 
still left in Manipur. We cannot, we cannot pan yeah, give up. We cannot yeah. give up. Okay. No, we cannot let, let, let me take this back to Professor Primal. And I want to return, uh, you know, I know you were very angry to see what happened with Vungzagi and uh, Valte, but let me return. And it was heartbreaking, actually. I couldn't believe it when I was interviewing the family. But let me return to women, what's happening with women, the bodies of women used as battlefields. And you're absolutely right. Uh, my family is a partition family. And we grew up on these stories of how women's bodies were used as a, uh, literally as a battlefield uh, at that time. Now, what we're seeing beyond the viral video, Professor, is other accounts now beginning to come out. For instance, today we have reported on two young women who were not just raped, they were murdered. Uh, this, is the, this is the accused in the first viral video, but if we can come out of this, and I want to talk about the second rape and murder that we are reporting on. Uh, and of course, we're withholding their identities. Two friends, 121, 124, used to work in a car wash for breadwinners for their families. Their parents can't go to the morgue and get their bodies. My, my question to you is, where do we start? Do, there is a judicial pro bono. There is Amit Shah had announced the Home Minister announced a judicial probe early on. Obviously, the fact of that judicial probe isn't bridging the trust deficit. So, where do we start with bridging the trust deficit, Professor Bimon? You see, I think you know uh, saying is easier at this thing, but I think I I believe that across the community, though I know that there are when I said it's the layered nature of the uh, you know. Uh, issues are involved which many people's discourses don't know even uh, you know though you get to hear these words but nobody pursued but i can tell you that if you go and do a genuine you know uh, not to try to fall into this minority majority tribe non tribe kind of a discourse and try to understand on the ground you will get to hear and if you are known if you know that place for a long time you know, insurgency, counter insurgency, drug, political competitions among politicians, their hanger on everything gets implicated in this, in, in this issue. So, you know, people reducing this into a, and including, I would say, Indian state is have, a, you know, people say, I, I also suspect sometimes, and since I'm very vocal uh, against the Armed Forces Special Power Act, I mean, you must know that you know, there's a principal ground whether you should use army in internal affairs or not is, is a fundamental principle questions that any democracy will ask. So can on I, that can basis, I, can I, can I respond just to that point uh, and say what? that that you you are against the AFSPA, but you can't put I would imagine the army in this internal management and then say please operate without the AFSPA, take a judicial magistrate every time. No, you go. I, I, I think, think the army no, no. shouldn't be. Shouldn't be there. No, no, no. I think, I think, I think that's that's an old argument, Burka. But you know, you see, American soldiers are involved in counter insurgency. Their standard of operations, please do see that. And all the special laws do not allow army to operate in the internal affairs anywhere in the world. It's very rare. India is one exception. Will be one of those few we can count on fingertips where you have a law passed by the Democratic Republican Parliament which enables the army to get involved in the internal affairs of the state. You remember that old saying, when the Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon in 49 BC, that was the beginning of the end of Roman Republic. There are books on the danger of involving army in internal affairs. This is a known thing. India is successful precisely because we have maintained the civilian authority over the armed forces and restricting them, they're involved. But we have this blot. Army can do their functions with under different kind of thing. I think Zibin Reddy had already suggested in what way army can operate with or without AFSPA, so I won't go into it. Let I'm just me, mentioning let, for one sorry. reason here, not we are not discussing on AFSPA per se, but I'm yeah. saying that I begin to hear that people are saying that AFSPA must be. So I'm seeing different interests getting entangled in these issues. Am I making sense what I'm hinting yeah, yeah, at? You, you, yeah, yeah. So it's we not one separate, element. So, so it's a very a complicated debate. issue. Yes. Sorry, I, I don't mean to cut you short, but since we have only two, three minutes left, I want to bring in Rami on this. Again, uh, AFSPA is a very complex conversation. We need to have a separate program yeah, on that. it. Uh, but but I want you to respond to what Professor Bimal has said, Rami, because the point is, uh, the sorry, Professor Bimal, you're trying to say something? Yes. Yeah, I'm just simply don't get confused when I said on principle ground, I'm objecting it. But remember that worse than AFSPA, what is happening in Manipur today is you are casting as persons on the institutions called the army, which is related.
effectively the only institution where people have trust. But in Manipur, it seems that they are losing the trust, which is dangerous. I was just going to say that if any institution has vestiges of trust, has any trust, it is actually right now the army. It's certainly not the political class. It's certainly not the police. It is the army. The army is the one, as you mentioned, Rami, that has rescued uh, people to safety. The army is the one right now that is actually able to talk to both communities. There is no other institution that isn't split down ethnic lines. Now, like I said, ASPA, we need to have a separate debate. People have very strong opinions for and against. The army is saying, if you expect us to substitute for the civil administration we can't do that without aspa don't expect us to substitute do your job why isn't the civil administration doing their job so now let's come back to closing comments what should happen next we also have a logjam in parliament let's talk about immediate measures rami your closing comment and then professor bimols barkha i think uh, immediate measures have to begin with somehow bringing these weapons back now let me tell you out of the 4000 weapons that have been uh, uh, are floating around in Manipur. Uh, they say about 15 to 2,000 weapons have been returned. But remember, a lot of these weapons are double barreled old rusted weapons that were looted. Some of the weapons that we are seeing on ground are sophisticated automatic weapons. You know, so we also, this is a part of, uh, you know, putting together a bigger map in terms of, you know, what are the other agencies, if there are any other from across the border that are involved. You know, so uh, this is a long term in investigation, but I think, you know, somehow getting weapons out of the hands of the common man is very important because now this is not a communal, uh, uh, this is not a, a tribal versus non tribal or a community versus community thing because now these weapons have gone into the hands of the fringe elements and that becomes dangerous. Number two, I think there needs to be some sort of intervention like you said you know a third party whether it's the naga that step in to form a civil society uh, dialogue between these communities because there are very rational and reasonable voices that are still existing once that happens once that dialogue comes you know it is going to take some time to bridge the fault lines you know it's not going to be that easy to come to the solution and i think what both communities Barka, need to understand that they have their set of demands or their grievances both communities it will have to wait a while before it is addressed nothing is going to happen right now you know okay. so this sort of urgency needs to you know we need to deal urgency with urgency has to be actually to restore the writ of the state uh and, right. and, and and to bring the violence down and to bring the weapons back that has to be the immediate thing that happens professor bimal of course there's a lot of focus on how many gun licenses the billion Singh government gave and so on but as a concluding remark what are the two or three things you think the government and i have to say when i say government i mean the center because to me it seems the billion Singh government has now reached a point of dysfunctionality that one can't look to it to make interventions what do you think the center must be doing at this point i think the union government must use all its powers and agencies to disarm uh, people in that state and they must have a serious look at the sioux as well these armed groups who have been in talks with the government of india uh, i think we are talking about four thousand uh, weapons and so on which is we're counting in terms of the looting but there are so many images uh, and let's not assume that uh, these are the all looted arms around. There are much more sophisticated weaponaries are available or involved. And you must also know, I talk to defense officers and they will tell you weapon is secondary. The fact is that how does these ammunitions are coming from for have such a long thing? There is a story behind that. This is what some army retired officers told me that you should not be worried about the weapons alone, but the ammunitions for two months and yes. that kind of thing so i think the first thing is to disarm so that violence is controlled by invoking using all the security measures this is to uh, take the first step okay i think i don't buy the argument that you need apspa for this you have enough provisions to have a flake mass to crack down under certain uh, sections in crp itself and and that must be done you know there's a responsible way of responding to it and this is the first step. Second, I would suggest that the prime minister or somebody must start a conversation among these MLAs first. This, his own party MLAs at least. Bring them to Delhi and make them speak. And even if they don't talk, let them look at each other for half an hour in the presence of a yeah. union ministers. 
and I, I would suggest that even like uh, wearing you know husband and wife issues somebody sits the therapist in between let them have a physical contact first like the face to face and the third i think rami uh, has suggested a civil society conversation must begin and i have suggested this elsewhere as well i think we can think of people like very highly respected figures like niketu iralu from nagaland you have janu barua from uh, you know assam and uh, even this uh, you know i've heard uh, even ratan thiam is trusted by some of these people even from the kuki communities so let them not to find faults just to talk it out this grievances and what is the way out i think that these three uh, measures and the fourth the uh, not the what is that last not the less i think everybody in the rest of the country especially media must have a mirror in front of themselves and see whether they are following the ethical guidelines of reporting a communal crisis like this i think okay. that will solve the problem because it is this reporters which have led to uh, making billion out of some community and mizoram is a direct effect of a trans state in fact it's yes. happened because of the media's behavior strong words there we leave it there for our audience to 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 respond to to think over the mizoram reference let me just explain we are seeing metis have to leave uh, mizoram now from from fear so there is a ripple effect uh, in in all states of the northeast uh, and and eventually this is uh, about india uh, and this is a very sensitive border state uh, thank you professor bimol and uh, and and rami desai for your time today i'm sure a lot of people learned a lot from both of you uh, and we'll keep a close eye on the manipur story in the meantime thank you so much and thank you to our audience for watching see you tomorrow same time it's great to see you here thank you for watching our work If you haven't subscribed yet don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent robust journalism.